Rosie and Bill Show wish to thank our primary sponsors. The Mallon Agency, located in Springfield, PA, where they take pride in exceeding expectations every time. The Roselli Agency. Brian and his team of insurance professionals have been serving the needs of Chester County for more than two decades. Anthony DiCecco and our friends at Tennis Addiction are ready to serve all your tennis needs at their beautiful facility in Exton, PA. Cause tonight I am stars above. How did I ever win your love? What did I do? What did I do? What did I say? To make you turn your angel eyes my way Hi everyone, welcome to the Rosie and Bill Show. Our guest this week has worn many hats in the music industry. He's been nominated for a Grammy and multiple Dove Awards. Please welcome to the Rosie and Bill Show one third of the group known as the Goodwin Brothers, Jonathan Goodwin. Jonathan, Thank welcome you. to the show. Thank you all so much for having me. Jonathan, it's it's our pleasure. We're, we're really looking forward to getting to know you and to get to know more about the Goodwin Brothers. And what we'd like to do is, is kind of jump in the time machine for a little bit and, and take a little bit of a trip back. Because like so many of our other guests, you started playing an instrument at a very early age. So, so what was it that drew you to the piano at the ripe old age of four? Right. Yeah. Well, it, it's all we had in the house growing up. You know, we weren't like kids these days. I mean, I'm not um, I'm not a senior citizen yet by any means, but I am uh, pushing 40 now. And we were kids, you know, it wasn't like the generation that we live in today, you know, always with a tablet or something in our hands. If we wanted to play with anything, it was a stick outside or, uh, you know, just whatever you found. And luckily, uh, my brother and I were were really raised a lot and influenced by our grandmother and our grandparents and she played piano in church and had a piano in the house so um that's that's what we did and uh, that's how it started did she teach you or did you take lessons from someone else you know i i was um you could say self-taught i guess um i play by ear so through the years now um i, I play by national charts and and can read music now um, but starting out just just by ear, she may have showed me a few little chords and things. But um, I remember one of the stories that she used to tell everybody before she passed was that she came home from work one day and I said I was going to play Amazing Grace for her. And I was just, you know, three, four years old. And she just laughed and nodded her head, you know, and then she said she heard me start Amazing Grace, you know, with one finger. And so she knew then that I at least could hear music and could find it. So uh, that's kind of how it started. That's amazing. And you know, there is this innate ability when at that age, you can already play by ear and you have this natural affinity for it. Now, you were about eight years old and your brother was six, correct? When you started playing together. Yeah. And then I understand. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, that was about the time that Will started showing interest in music, too. I was already you know, loving it. And uh, he got to the point where he, he was at a really young age and he started hearing harmony and, uh, and jumping in. And you recorded an album a few short years later. Is that right? We did. Yeah. We, um, we were singing a lot in church and, and around home, you know, local churches and things and revivals. And, you know, it was a big thing to have the young kids that could sing, you know, as a part of their church services or whatever. But we had a lot of people that would say, you know, would love to hear, love to have a CD or love to hear them recorded. So um, we remember we were, we, it was, it was probably five or six years later. I was about 13, 14. We was 11 or 12. And uh, we went in the studio and did our first record together. And it's, it still floats around. Sometimes we see them. Uh, we have people that say they still have them when we're playing around home. So that was 30 years ago, but it's, it was a lot of fun. That's really amazing. And then you started touring on the bluegrass circuit. What was that experience like at such a young age? And how do you compare it to now? Was it a much simpler time then? Oh, yeah, most definitely. Um, you know, and and the thing about it is, you know, when, when you're young and you play, um, you may not be a protege or you may not be this, the next best thing, but it's always cute. It's always interesting. And it's always 
appealing to see, you know, any young people. And that's why our group now champions and, and we support a lot of music care causes that that support young people in music because we were young when we started. But it, it was a lot easier then. Um, you certainly didn't worry about the logistics of things and um, having to leave work to go and play music. It's just something that we did and we did it because we loved it. And I remember we would travel. It didn't matter. If it was a thousand miles across the country. If we had the opportunity to be on stage somewhere. We love to do it. So yes, times have changed a lot, but um, the good thing about the, the kind of music that we do, I feel in my heart, um, just pure earthly acoustic music is that um, the crowd hasn't much changed. Of course, you know, we all evolve and the music evolves, but, you know, people that love bluegrass and acoustic and Americana music, gospel music, um, they're down home roots people that just love, uh, love great music. So it's, it's a good thing. Well, Jonathan, in addition to playing that great music for as long as you have, you've also done some other things and, and had several different roles over the last couple of decades. You were uh, a record a label owner. You headed up an artist management company, producer. And I actually had one question I was originally going to ask, but now I'm going to add one to it. And, and the first question is, can you share some of the highlights that you've had from each of those roles? And the second part now that I just thought of, and I, it's kind of a dangerous thing when I actually have a thought pop into my mind live <laughs> like this, but I'm, I'm going to roll with it because I'm wondering, having that experience now on the business side, has that helped or how has that impacted you as an artist here today? Yeah, so to answer the first part of your question, some of the highlights, I mean, I was, and, and I'll get into all three of the brothers a little later, but we've all, we all, after we became adults. We all went our own separate ways, but in, but all in music. All of us pursued music in different ways. And one of the things that I did was I ended up in Nashville at a very young age, 16, 17 years old, um, being able to roll chords and go get coffee for some of the best producers in, in music, and especially Christian music. And um, long story short, got my audio engineering license and uh, started just engineering and started um, being able to to just shadow a lot of these great producers. And then through the years, a lot of the artists that I connected with you know, hired me to either be a session player on their album or produce their album. So through the years, as far as highlights, I mean, I have been so blessed to be in the room with everybody, uh, the heroes that I grew up listening to. I mean, everybody from Dolly to Reba to Carrie Underwood um, in the Christian music world, Vance and Amy Grant, and um, just a lot of great artists that ended up trusting me to um make sure the music went down right, you know? And uh, so it was, it's been great as far as that part of the career. Now, as far as it helping us as an artist, I certainly think it has just because, and not just my background, but Will's as well and Chase, my other brother, because we've all had experience in the music business, not just as artists. So we all are aware of a lot of the logistics that come with it and a lot of the, um, just the details that need to be attended to that a lot of artists miss. And, um, you know, I've, for, through the years, uh, back in 2018, I was hired to go over the pond to, to London, teach a music business class. And one of the things I found out over there was that a lot of people, even older older folks that are pursuing this in whatever genre, uh, they just need somebody to show them some of the potholes, you know, that maybe we went through um, as trying to pursue it. You know, we were younger uh, to keep them from, from avoiding it. So it doesn't matter what age we are. Um, how long we've been in this thing, we all, as long as we keep a teachable spirit, we can all learn from each other. So it definitely has helped. It's interesting that you say that because I, I really think just as when you're going to be a doctor, you do a residency, you shadow doctors, I feel like there needs to be more mentoring in the arts. Because agree, yeah. It is a business and we're we're taught to focus on the craft but yes, you can have a manager sometimes or an agent, but but you still need to have a certain level of savvy to know what is expected of you. How do you navigate through? So I think it's really great that you that you've done that. And you're right; it doesn't matter how old someone is. You said something a few minutes ago about your brother, and you all went your own separate ways. What brought you and William back together? And what brought us together? I mean, we never. Um... You know, we were never estranged or anything. We always, you know, saw each other. But I, I was in Nashville most of the time, and Will was here in Kentucky. Um, both of us living life, doing our own thing. Um, but 
what happened during the pandemic was the same thing that happened for a lot of people. We were all stuck at home, you know, and at the time I was building a home back in Lexington. Um, we're, I'm originally from that area, Eastern Kentucky. And uh, so we were, I was there and Will was there and um, we ended up just spending some time together again and getting the old instruments out, you know, and he got to pull the mandolin out and I pulled the guitar out and we would just sit around and sing and we really um, just enjoyed it. And then the next thing you know, Chase was coming over and, we were doing a lot of the old songs that we did when we were younger. And um, the next thing you know, we did a video. We just put together a pandemic video like so many other artists, just us three in different spots on the video with called in some of my favorite musicians that we've known through the years and that um, have worked for me through the years on sessions. And um, we put out a video and it kind of just spun out of control and it turned into something that we never dreamed it would. And uh, I think that's kind of one of the beautiful things about the Goodwin Brothers is that this, this was not planned it was not something that we got a record deal and we knew we had to do it. It was just something we did because we loved the music and we were having fun. And it kind of has propelled into what it is today. Well, I'll tell you, I've seen quite a few of the videos back going back through, you know, the pandemic. And, and the one thing that uh, one of the videos that, that really caught my attention was you guys did a version of Colin Baton Rouge. And I remember a couple of years ago, we were lucky enough to have John Callen on the show. Yeah, and was there was a video of John doing it with Darren and Brooke Aldrich. And I'm yeah. sure you're familiar with, with those three folks, uh, three great artists in their own right. But I just love the way it was just, I watched it. And I, when it was over, I had to re, you know watch it again because it was just really, I mean, it's a great song. And you guys really knocked that out of the park along with every other one. So for folks who haven't seen the videos yet, I highly recommend that you go to the YouTube page and watch them because they are fantastic and they're real. They are mm -hmm. real and, and just, I'm going to come back to something I'd like to say about your harmonies. But before I do that, Jonathan, I wanted to just ask you about the music itself, because one of the things that I've seen and read over the last couple of years, and there seems to be a little bit of a common bond with bluegrass music and country in that there's almost like two camps. There's the traditional versus contemporary or old school, new school. And I, to me, I think it's all great, but I'm just wondering when you guys are getting together and, and looking at maybe adding a song to the repertoire or maybe going into the studio, do does any of that enter into the mix as far as this divide, so to speak, between old school, new school, traditional, contemporary? You know, Bill, it, it would if um, I was managing an artist, you know, or I'm producing a record on somebody else with us. Um, it really doesn't. And that, that may not be, you know, the right thing to say. Um, where the industry is concerned, but we did this. You mentioned like Colin Baton Rouge. There's a lot of songs like that on our first record that we did that literally there was no label involved, nothing like that. I just said, it's taken off. So let's go record some of the songs that we love singing, you know, and that included some of the new grass stuff, you know, that included uh, the old Colin Ray song, Little Rock, you know, some old country songs, some old bluegrass stuff. And we really didn't care, especially at the time uh, about sticking to a genre or trying to make sure that we didn't offend, you know, it hurt anybody's preference. We just wanted to do songs that we love to do and put our own spin on it. Um, but you're exactly right. There is a kind of a great divide, especially in the bluegrass world. You know, it's the only genre. I was talking to a guy the other day, but it's the only genre that they literally, you know, they require you to use certain instruments or you're not in their genre. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's a lot, it's a lot different than maybe others. But uh, we just keep doing what we're doing, and it seems to work thus far. So we're thankful for that. It's interesting that that does seem to be a through line that once people get back to their roots and what what really speaks to their heart, it, it generally seems to be when things gel and take off and perpetuate work. So that's great. I noticed on your page that you have a mantra up there that says, don't just exist, live. Can you speak to that for us? Uh, well, like I said earlier, you know, we all grew up in the church and a lot of people think, you know, when you hear that, especially for musicians, you, know, you think a bunch of religious fanatics, you know, or a bunch of kids that just grew up in legalism or whatever. Uh, we're the, the least people like that that you'll ever meet. Um, we, But I, I learned a lot growing up in church. I learned how to love Jesus and I learned how to, to, to trust God. And I think that there's so many people that even take the spirituality part out of it that really go through their day to day and they they just exist. They just go through the motions. They just do the same things every day. 
And one of the things that, um, to wrap it all kind of up, but with the Goodwin brothers that, you know, I, I've said this to Will multiple times, I've said it to Chase, and I've said it to all of our band now that work with us. If it ever gets to the point where we're not having fun, let's just not do it. You know, it's it's it, it's not worth it because it's it's a job, or now we have obligations to certain people. We've been really cautious in not, not over-obligating ourselves, not overdoing it, but to really enjoy what we do. And I think so many people get into the habit, whether it's a job or, um, or music or a career or whatever it might be where they, uh, they just go through the motions. So yeah, that's, that's kind of, that's kind of my motto just to make sure that everybody every day, um, you know, live, enjoy the moments I'm learning the older I get, I've got a baby on the way now. So my first, so I'm learning every day because I think back about my grandparents that I mentioned earlier and how I would never want to wish anybody back before this. But now that I've got a baby on the way, I was telling my dad the other day, I'd like to have some of them back to experience this with me. And that just reminds me that every day is precious. So we should live every day, enjoy it and cut out the bad, you know. That's great advice. Yeah, the wise words, and and I love what you said about you know there there are unfortunately people out there that just kind of exist rather than live and and living life to the fullest, and it's being able to do what you love to do and having fun doing it really is key, and that's why Rosie and I love doing this show and love having the opportunity to get to know people like yourself, Jonathan. That's that's what we love to do, and one thing that. I think was pretty clear to us as we watched the video for your new song was that you guys really love everyday thing. But what's interesting is from what we understand, that song was actually written several years ago and came close, but didn't quite make the cut for a couple of other albums with some other well-known artists, but then you guys really gravitated to it. So what was it about the song it really resonated with you because I have my thoughts, but I'm curious as to, to what yours were. Well, one of the things that we realized after we did our first record, I mentioned men and go of just songs that we love to sing. Um, we got a call from when our manager reached out to us and said, Hey, this record label is you know, in bluegrass music. It's been around for 30 years. One of the labels that we used to listen to growing up with the Osborne brothers and people like that, but they've reached out to us and they, they want to sign you to two record deals. So we knew that that meant, going into the studio, we needed some original material now. You know, this thing's getting kind of serious. So um, I, I met Tom Payton at a session that I was producing on another artist, actually, a country artist. He walked in, he was writing some songs for her. Tom has written songs for Olivia Newton-John, a lot of great artists through the years. And um, he it was the first time we'd ever met, but he he said, I've heard, I've heard of your brother, you and your brothers, and I'd love to, I have a couple songs I'd love to pitch to you. And he sent us about five songs out of the five, two of them were on the new record. But uh, he's a phenomenal writer, and uh, not only is he a great writer, but he he writes stuff that um, that fits us really well. We feel like, but yeah, you're exactly right. Shenandoah, Marty Raven, and, and those guys had a hold on the song for um, for a couple of years. The Oak Ridge Boys had a hold on the song, and um, it just never worked. Um, not that they didn't love it; it just they took it into the studio with you know the way they do 25, 30 songs potentials, and uh, they they get to the best ones first, you know, and uh, so I believe it was saved for us, and we're thankful for that because people seem to really be enjoying it. Well, it's fabulous the way you all do it. So I think you're right. It's the right fit. And Thanks. you have an album in the works now. Tell us about that, and when will that be released? Sure. The album's done. Uh, we finished it um, maybe a month ago, but it's it's releasing, uh, let's see, in late July. So we're doing our album release party the last weekend of July at the world famous station in, in Nashville, we'll be doing a show that night there to, to release the, the album, but it's, it's something that we are really proud of. It's got almost all original material on it. Um, we have some songs that, um, like I said, the two that Tom wrote, we've got a song that um, a family member of ours wrote. We've got some really cool stuff and it's not just bluegrass. There's a lot of straight, you know, forward bluegrass on there, but there's a lot of great stuff too, that will fall under the uh, country Americana stuff that people love. So we hope there's something on there for everybody. We really enjoyed doing it. Well, if everyday thing is any indication, we, we can't wait to hear the rest of the songs. And, and I mentioned earlier that I kind of had my thoughts and Rosie just kind of touched on it and you touched on it. But to me, that song was meant to be recorded by you guys because it showcases the flawless and seamless harmonies that you guys, it's absolutely amazing. And also great musicianship. 
So to me, that's that's a pretty unbeatable combination. So I'm wondering, Jonathan, having the harmonies to the level and the degree that you do, the outstanding musicianship, what do you think is the ultimate upside for the group? And I'm going to use the word ultimate again, and sort of. Ultimately, what do you think success would look like for you and your brothers? Well, I think the upside for, for us as a band in, in the genre that we're in uh, is that I would put my brothers up, and I'm partial, but I'd put them up vocally against about anybody. And and I can say that because I, I work with professional singers every day in the studio, and, and they are two of the best singers you'll find anywhere. That's just, just, just the bottom line. Uh, I barely hang on when I'm singing with them, and that's why you don't hear me leave anything on the records, you know. Um, I have a solo album out that I did years ago, and we were just about to trash that because just nobody, you know, everybody loves to hear Wheel and Chase, but... Um, that's the upside is that they're great singers. Not that there's not great singers in bluegrass, but you can almost name, uh, you know, on two hands, some of the leading vocalists in bluegrass through the years, you know, from Bobby Osmond to Ralph, to, you mentioned John Cow and others. You know, there's not been a whole lot of real strong vocal bands in our genre. So that's kind of what has been something that people really gravitate to. And what happens is we see this two bills. A lot of people that don't like bluegrass at all will come to a, a Goodman Brothers show and they realize, hey, I, I kind of like bluegrass now, you know, and they'll dig into old Osmond brothers or Bill Monroe or whatever it is. And they'll realize they like that as well, you know? So it's bringing new fans in and uh, that's kind of the upside. And I forgot the last part of your question. It was, <laughs> what do you think for both you and your brothers, what would success ultimately look like? Yeah. So, you know, it would be for us to continue to do this and have fun and be able to really thrive with it, make a good living with it and us to be able to continue to make music that people love. And one of the things that, that we do that's a little different than, you know, a lot of bands I work with, a lot of bands through the years is, you know, they want to take you on a roller coaster at their shows to where you're up one minute down the next and all that. And all that's great. But one of the things that we try to consistently do, especially with our singles at radio and our videos that we do, is do what we call real good, feel good music. You know, just stuff that makes people forget about what's going on in their in their world, in their life, the problems that we all face every day, the stuff that everybody goes through. When you hear the Goodwin Brothers, we want you to smile. You know, and that doesn't mean there's not going to ever be a song. Some of the new stuff on our, on our record is songs that are packed with conviction, you know, and they're packed with emotion. All that's good, and there's time and place for that. But the, the main thing that we love to do and we want to continue doing and it would equal success for us is to continue to make people smile and uh, to continue to make them great music. Well, I have to say that it's hard to not smile. It's hard to not tap your feet or move when listening to your music. So I think you've already accomplished that goal. And I do hope that you continue because it's, it's something that is really important for people to have. Thank you. Yeah, it's important for us. And and we've seen, especially through the pandemic, you know, we've seen so many sicknesses, so many lives lost, so many people that were just struggling. And um, it's, you know, times are hard for everybody. And so we we just, we love doing what we do because it, it really lifts people's spirits, we feel like. And we get letters every day from people that just say, you know, they go to bed, listen to our music, or they wake up and listen to it, or they clean their house and listen to it, and it just lifts their spirits. And that's our goal. It, it really does. And it's contagious, Jonathan, because once I started listening to a couple of songs, I wanted to listen to a couple more. And, and now I've, I've listened like I'm waiting for the new ones to come out because you're exactly right. And, and Rosie just said it makes you smile, makes you feel good. And, and I commend you for having that as a goal and, and a measure of success, because I can't think of anything better to do for others than to make them feel good, make them smile and maybe make them clap their hands and tap their feet a little bit, too, while they're at it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. No, hey, we thank you. And I'll tell you, it's been great, Jonathan, getting to know you, getting to know a little bit more about your brothers, Will and Chase. We wish you nothing but the best. We're looking forward to the new album coming out. And again, that was at the end of July, I believe you said? Yeah. Yes, end of July this year, 2023. Okay. And one last thing, if you guys are ever anywhere in the Northeast, near the Philadelphia, New Jersey area, please make sure you let us know because we'd like to come feel good and get to meet you guys in person. Be wonderful. We'd love to have you anytime for sure. All right. Well, again, Jonathan, thank you so much for joining us. We really enjoyed it. Folks, we hope you've enjoyed it as well. We'll see you next week. Some people start off 
with a big romance A black tie wedding and a fancy dance Then it's off to an island in the deep blue sea They get back home thinking that's how love should be And underneath the neon light When they close the doors We head on down the Truck stop breakfast at the edge of town Oh, oh, oh.